Thank you everyone for joining to this session of Soundbites. And to date, uh, we'll be talking about the impact of modern directional microphones in the spatial alternative speech. Uh, and this is a big topic of a great interest of mine. I've worked for many years in the field of technology, and specifically looking at directional technology. And I have a personal interest in understanding how uh, directional microphones impact the every, everyday living uh, standards and uh, conditions of people with hearing impairment. So um, I don't have a lot of time in this talk to go into understanding technology as such, but I will try to define the problem statement as to why we're looking at directional technology. Uh, then I will describe my research methodology and I will provide you with a summary of the results we have achieved so far. So let's start by looking at what the problem is with directional systems. So what we have here is a typical or conventional laboratory experiment or setup where we have a listener sitting right in the middle of an array, and then we have positioned a number of sound sources around the listener. Uh, as we can see, for example, we have a target location of a sound source represented potentially by a loudspeaker, and then we have noise sources around. Um, and this is the typically what we do in uh, conventional laboratory experiments. So we typically fit a hearing aids to the, uh, to the patients on the left and the right, and then we actually go about evaluating what they do. So as an example, I will be talking about the difference between omnidirectional and more directional systems like cardioid and beam formats as well. So let's try to understand what this omnidirectional signal do in this environment. So um, what you see on the screen, if I can bring that up, is what we call a polar response. Uh, the red is for the right hand side of the head, and the blue is for the left hand side of the head, uh, essentially where the microphones are placed. As you can see, uh, what it happens when uh, this figure describes the sensitivity of the microphone uh, in relation to the direction of the sound source. So for sound sources that are located uh, on the target direction, uh, the microphone has equal sensitivity to just about anywhere on the right hand side. And then the sensitivity decreases to the opposite side. And uh, the reason behind that is that the sounds are uh, actually generated from this side of the head. They need to go over the head before they arrive at the microphone location. As a result, they cast an acoustic shadow. So what we see here is the acoustic shadowing effect of this uh, uh, um, source on this microphone. And of course, you see the opposite true to be true when you look at the microphone on the left hand side of the head. So uh, this particular listener will actually hear almost anything in the same way because we then combine the two ears. There is pretty much the same intensity of sounds being uh, presented uh, from the microphone point of view. So what happens with uh, something like a cardio, the figure in the middle? Uh, the cardio has this property where it's designed to suppress sounds from other directions other than more or less the frontal direction. Uh, the problem with that is the head uh, uh, is also in between, especially when they are positioned to the left and to the right side of the head. The head is in between, it's casting a shadow on the characteristic uh, response of the microphone, and as a consequence, the directionality gets to be tilted towards the right of the head. And this is quite, quite common what you observe in, uh, in real life listening conditions, where the directionality sensitivity of a micro or directional microphone uh, position on the left appears not to be this directly to the front, but slightly to the right. And it's so is true for the other side of the head. Now, when uh, we talk about uh, more directional systems, uh, this is an, just an example of what a directional system looks like in terms is of polar uh, characteristics and it, directivity sensitivity. Uh, so what we can see is some far more narrow uh, directionality uh, in terms of response. It is sort of focused very sharply in a given spatial direction and typically that direction is where the target is. Uh, so uh, by looking at the difference between the three different configurations, you can see why uh, this super directional system will be superior in attenuating the noises around the listener compared to the other two. So in terms of increased uh, uh, directionality, we go from omni to cardio with a more conventional system designs, and then we go from cardio to beamformance. So in terms of speech understanding noise, uh, the sort of research uh, actually shows us that these uh, type of arrangement, they, they help you to understand the target speech in these sort of noise configurations. But when it comes to cardio, they do slightly better 
than you observe with omnidirectionals. And then again, when you look at beam formats, you get a significant improvement of speech understanding in noise because the beam format tends to focus more specifically on target and attenuate pretty much anything else. So uh, the listener has less trouble in uh, hearing and recalling those sounds presented by the target location. So uh, let's consider something different. Let's consider what happened when the target moved to the side. And here we have moved the target to the side in the same sort of representation layout. And what we see is essentially that our directional system sti still captures that particular sound, although it's moved to the right. So it doesn't have any problems in capturing that sound. The uh, more directional system, the cardio also is able to capture that sound location so the listener can hear the sound quite effectively and he has no trouble in doing that. Uh, there are some differences between the two, but for the most part, uh, the effect is not that different uh, between the, the omni and the directional. For a, for a target location, this is likely moved to the right hand side. The problem comes when these higher directionality systems, uh, um, the, because of the way they are designed, uh, when a target sound is moved to the right and off from the main axis or direction, then it's no longer in the pathway of this narrow directionality, and as a consequence, the person is not going to be able to hear that particular sound effectively, and in fact, it will uh, start to emphasize something else, like the noise. And so in this particular condition, uh, the, this particular type of technology, it will not be a positive thing for the listener, and will pr produce a negative effect. Um, but of course, we have moved a long ways uh, into trying to understand what directional, uh, in terms of technology. And now technologies are designed to deal with more complex listening situations, as you can see, are represented by this configuration here, which is just not arbitrary configuration, where you actually see the distribution of noise sources all over the place, in addition to uh, something that will be more complex when you happen to have perhaps more than one just target location and the target location happens to be just about anywhere around you. So what happened with only uh, what happened with beam format system is that uh, beam formats are now able to broaden its uh, output characteristics in such a way that you may be able to capture uh, the information present from those locations. Uh, unfortunately, at the same time, uh, you also capturing some of the noises that is present in, the, in those sort of uh, frontal locations as well. Um, you can also develop technology that will have a uh, very narrow directionality, but instead of broadening, what it might try to do is try to uh, move around in terms of searching for that particular target sound source. And when it locks into the specific target sound source, it will provide the emphasis uh, of that particular target location. So we could scout uh, uh, sort of searching for the main target speech and then just lock into that. Of course, there are some difficulty, difficulties, practical difficulties in to be able to, uh, to do something like that in practice. Uh, and then we have uh, something a little bit more advanced and complicated when um, what we're actually doing here is using some statistical basis to try to characterize this acoustic space, which is very complex, and we combined some information about where we believe a particular target uh, of interest is located with this concept of, of broadening. So it's a combination of these two, in some ways, uh, using statistics uh, uh, to produce something slightly different. And what we end up producing is a, a, some sort of pattern characteristics that is a little bit unusual, but is more effective in being able to capture the targets of interest when we get multiple targets specifically in relation to uh, the noise sources. We have a very good suppression of the noise sources around it. So this is looks at like a very amazing and very good solution, but the question is, it's fairly new technology. Uh, so the question is how effective uh, these type of solutions are in real world listening conditions. And that's the reason why we go about trying to explore these ideas in the laboratory. So let's now move uh, to our research methods. And before I actually go into our specific research, I just want to recall something I talked in past sessions of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the seminars, where I talk about realistic listening conditions. And I always argue that a realistic listening condition is one that uh, happens to have uh, some sound sources that are different distances from the listener. 
uh, and also we have a little bit of reverberation simulating the sort of things you experience in real life listening conditions. So for example, a cafeteria with multiple people sitting on tables and having conversations and you being positioned anywhere on the cafeteria and listening to them and these happen to be at multiple distances. And of course the sounds that generate tend to reflect on walls and surfaces and they all arrive to you at the same time. So this is a very complex type of background noises. In addition to that, when you go into restaurants, you don't just go in trying to hear sounds and recall them. That's not what we do, although that's what we tend to do in the laboratory. In real life listening situations, we tend to use a little bit more of message processing. So we are we are engaging in conversations. We are, we are very interested in to understand the context of that conversation. And we also use a lot of memory and a lot of other factors that are involved in our ability to understand it. So and now we'll develop material to be able to access this sort of uh, uh, functionality, which we call the di dynamic conversational test or DCT. And you want to know more about this, please uh, uh, go into YouTube and you can play back some of the uh, recordings we've done in previous uh, sessions about realistic listening environments. So this is the sort of uh, type of environments are going to be using to assess the technology because it's a more realistic. But we need to go a, a little bit higher than that in this particular location because we're talking about something else as well. We're talking about something that's happening in this uh, particular representation, this pictorial representation of a restaurant where three people are having a conversation. So what's happening here is that we have a more dynamic uh, type of environment when a listener might be engaging not just with one person but with multiple people. And uh, this is the sort of representations we need to capture in the laboratory to be able to understand the actual effect we will find in this new type of technology. Okay, with that out of the way, let's look uh, more specifically as to what we actually did. Just one second, please. So um, on the left hand side here, what we have is that our recruitment process, we actually identified 10 non hearing participants uh, and 10 um, hearing impaired listeners. Uh, what we did, we actually feed them with actual hearing aids and then we provide them uh, for and to be able to hear the sounds, we just provide them with the null and the two amplification uh, targets. So this is more or less the distribution of hearing losses and this stands for four frequency averages. Okay. So I will start with just describing the technology we actually use for this particular study. Uh, we use uh, essential technology that was provided uh, to us by Oticom. Uh, and that particular hearing aid technology happened to have two features where we wanted to evaluate. Uh, one feature is called the Pina Omni, which is functions as an omnidirectional microphone, essentially. It was our reference uh, condition. We also use uh, this type of beam format technology that is refers us to the Open Sound Navigator, um, which combines uh, very uh, super directionality functions with noise reduction features uh, and uses an additional type of this multi tolka type of searching algorithms that enable you to engage in communication with multiple talkers. Uh, so, um, and just to put into context of what we described before, uh, we are comparing essentially this type of thing against this type of thing. Uh, so that that gives us a little bit of interesting uh, aspects we need, need to explore with this technology. So um, let's now look at the tasks we ask people to do. Uh, one of the first things we actually ask people to do is, of course, do what we always ask people to do is to recall sound sentences in noise. Uh, we call that the speech and noise test assessments. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we set up to measure this at approximately 95% intelligibility. Uh, we were not looking to understand what happened in the intelligibility space. Uh, when you have dynamic to, uh, targets as described here, where we actually position targets randomly from other plus or minus 45 degrees. Uh, the reason why we selected this particular criteria was more, more uh, used as reference for the following test, which is the dynamic uh, comprehension test. Uh, as you can see, uh, what we did, we selected the SNR we identified here and we added uh, an, another 3 dB SNR improvement. And the whole rationale behind that is that while people were doing this particular test, they have full intelligibility of the target sounds. 
Uh, and so that was the main rationale behind that. And that becomes it will become very important as we try to understand uh, what this research is telling us. In addition to that, uh, we actually selected uh, conversation conversation material from two talkers, and they were positioned at uh, plus 22 to minus 67 degrees, or minus 22 and plus 67 degrees. Uh, so they were actually moving to, to the right, to the left of the listener, and the locations were selected, or the pair of locations were selected randomly as well. Um, in addition to this, um, what we also asked uh, our participant is to tell us the degree of listening effort uh, they experience while performing each run of the test, specifically the now at DCT test. Another measure, and that will become a little bit important, although I will not focus on this particularly in this talk, is the, uh, the measure of cognitive measures. Uh, we use reaction time to as a proxy for uh, the cognitive uh, processing ability of the person to perform a task, and we did that in quiet. So let's um, just look at some of the results. Uh, so what we have here is that the speech intelligibility not result. Uh, the y-axis actually shows the correct uh, SIN, uh, speech intelligibility performance of the scores. And on the x-axis, we have the two groups. We have the normal hearing group on the left, and we have the hearing impaired group on the right. So and what you can see is that for the normal hearing group, we were sort of reaching a little bit of saturation on the responses, this is the 98% in performance, very near 100% ceiling effects. But for the hearing impaired group, we see larger difference, specifically between the PINA Omni and this beam format type of technology, the OSN based technology. Uh, and actually doing a statistical assessment, we observe significant difference in these two groups, but not so much into this particular group here. So we now move into uh, looking at what happened uh, in the DCT scores. Again, the y-axis just gives the DCT scores in percentage, and the x-axis is just a, a, a separation between the two groups, the normal hearing group and the hearing impaired group, as we did before. So again, uh, for uh, the uh, condition for the normal hearing group, we did not see much difference between two. Essentially, they are very close to ceiling in terms of performing this comprehension assessment, but we see some differences for the hearing impaired group. And in fact, those differences here were actually significant for the two. Uh, what that means is that we see a significant improvement of the beam format technology over the PINA for the hearing impaired group while performing the DCT, uh, DCT uh, assessment for task. When it came to the self-rating effort, it was not surprising that for the hearing impaired group, uh, we see significant difference. This is just, the, by the way, the y-axis is just the self-rating effort in a 10-point scale. So 10 means, uh, of course, a lot of effort. A lower number means less effort. So the lower the value, the better for the, pay, uh, the participants. And so what we see here is what we expect to see, uh, that people tend to have less effort, at least self-rate effort, when they're listening to the beam format, and that was for the both groups you know, about the same. And in fact, the significance for the growth books was uh, quite uh, robust uh, in this particular assessment. Um, so this is very interesting. Uh, so let's try to um, uh, try to understand in a different way. To try to understand the relationship between our intelligibility assessment and what the um, uh, DCT test is telling us, uh, what I did is I, I put it together into a mixed effect model. Um, and the model essentially is trying to relate the performance of intelligibility against a number of variables. In this case, the different type of microphones, and that would be the PINA Omni and the uh, beam former, uh, as well as the hearing loss profile the person had and in addition to that reaction time. Uh, I used the subject just a random variable to make the system to the, the model a bit more robust. So this is what this particular model outputs and eventually is just giving us that the microphone uh, has a significant effect on the actual scores. Um, so I did the same, of course, for the DCT test. Now uh, I use the same model and the same parameters as an input. Uh, and this time I go with something in a slightly different uh, model. Uh, so the main point to, to see here is that this model and this model are significantly different. Uh, here you only have an effect of the microphones, where here you have effect of a number of other things, including the reaction time which is uh, very interesting. And I will not be talking about this today, but uh, I just want to point that out on the difference between the two things. Uh, what my interest is, is more on the effect of the microphone and what we see here that we have an effect of about 2.3% improvement 
uh, as we go from PINA to uh, the more directional average. And here we go about 12% improvement as we go from PINA to the uh, beam format or the more advanced processing strategy. Um, so let's try to understand what that means. And to do that, I have created this illustration here. So the X axis does give us a test SNR for a particular listener. The Y axis tells us about intelligibility uh, that person have in noise. Uh, so this was more or less where we decided to perform the test around 95% and it was about the average performance we observed across the participants. And what we saw was that on average, 95% uh, we got about 2.3% improvement, perhaps because we are getting into this saturation region of the, the psychometric function in relation to intelligibility in SNR. Uh, but what's also interesting is that when we were very close to a potentially at ceiling effects, uh, we also say we also see an additional improvement of about 12% when we actually test at the DCT, and that's the improvement between PINA and the beam format, uh, the OSN beam format from Oticon. Uh, so um, that's very interesting because uh, this story tells us that the different things happening here as opposed to what's happening in there. Uh, we are observing improvement when people have a hundred percent intelligibility uh, as well. So um, this story by itself is very interesting, uh, but we can dig a little bit further as to what this means to a person out there in the real world. And to do that, I will use uh, this particular diagram. Uh, the particular diagram, uh, what it shows us on the X axis are the scores for a number of participants that have performed the reading span test. And as you know, the reading span test assess things in multiple dimensions to, in relation to cognition and processing speed in, la in language processing. Uh, and what we've done, because there are multiple dimensions, we have collapsed those dimensions using a principal component analysis, and we just taking the, the main principal component out of that, and we just plot that here. Uh, so a higher value means good, a lower value means lower processing capability to the person in terms of the cognitive functionality. Here we actually have the scores for the analysis T and percentage correct. Again, a higher score is better than a lower score. And what's interesting about this graph is there's in fact a very nice relationship between the two. Um, so uh, here what I've done, I just plot uh, an arbitrary point on that regression line. And, and I just projected that uh, to the X axis. So what have I done that? The reason I have done that is because we've proven that this technology uh, provides a significant improvement of uh, performance in the DCT domain uh, to the participant when they actually are com we're comparing the PINA against the beam format. So what we're actually saying is that we go from the reference line from there, that point shown by the arrow, and that actually we end up with something a little bit higher uh, as shown by that straight line. But what's interesting is when we start thinking about what that means in this space, uh, what it means is essentially that we also need to put that, that line a little bit farther to the right. And uh, we end up with a different picture altogether. Uh, and what we can see or can argue is that the performance of this person that was given this new beam format technology was comparable to someone uh, with higher cognitive function, but uh, that was uh, utilizing the, um, the the more less directional system, the PINA uh, Omni uh, technology, and that must have an impact on people out there in the real world. Uh, I guess the, uh, there's more research that needs to be done in this space, but uh, this is uh, one of the uh, most significant changes I have seen in, in relation to trying to relate uh, the cognitive functionality and how uh, technology interact uh, with people. Um, in that in the respect. So uh, let's uh, try to um, summarize this now. So in summary, uh, what we are talking about is this specific environment where uh, we have a lot of complexity and we are engaged in a very complex task trying to communicate with multiple people at the same time, and we're trying to evaluate with a technology such as the beam format, uh, especially this new type of adaptive beam formats, is able to help the listener function in this environment. So what we observed so far was that the uh, the wear recall measures we did uh, actually improve, even though we actually were measuring at the very high uh, intelligibility levels, at, at near saturation of 95%, we actually saw significant improvement 
uh, on 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 the performance of the people when we actually uh, switch between the two uh, technologies. In addition to that, we asked, we also saw a significant improvement in comprehension scores uh, for the hearing impaired group, uh, and that was about 12% uh, in performance. Uh, and we also saw uh, a self rated listening effort to decrease when we used the more advanced uh, microphone feature. And that was for both groups, the hearing impaired listeners and for the normal hearing group. Uh, and in general, our observation was that the effects of the advanced microphone setting was equivalent to having uh, less hearing loss, as we saw with by the regression model, the miss effect model. But also, uh, as we can see by the analogy uh, in the last slide, is that so what can be related to an improved cognitive functionality, at least in the conversation, uh, uh, conversational function or tasks they went about in doing. It. And that must have a significant impact on in, in terms of what people experience out there uh, in the real world. So before I, uh, um, I close down this uh, talk, uh, I'd like to say thank you to the sponsors uh, for providing the financial support for this research as well as technology and also advise me on how to, how to best utilize the technology. Uh, and special thanks goes to Elaine, who also have a number of conversations uh, trying to understand the significance of the research we have done uh, so far. Thank you.